Hi guys, Jeremy Four Sons Off Road here. So uh, just doing this uh, live stream real quick. I uh, don't want to take too uh, long here. Probably you know ten minutes or so just to go over some basic questions that guys have about these mini trucks. So if you have any questions, be sure to uh, just write them in the comments and I'll get to them right away. And uh, the questions can be as general or as specific as you want. So uh, a few things that we do want to go over are the real common questions that we get, uh, you know, in the U S and Canada, these, there's a, a little bit of difference with these mini trucks in terms of what we're allowed to bring in, what you're allowed to bring in, in the States versus what we're allowed to bring in in Canada, uh, what street legal. So in Canada, the, the, it's pretty simple. They have to be 15 years old. So a mini truck has to be 15 years old before it can even get into the country. Um, once it's 15 years old, it can be brought in in most provinces as an on-road vehicle or off-road vehicle. But uh, regardless of the designation on-road or off-road, doesn't matter. It has to be 15 years old. In the United States, these mini trucks, there's different classifications. Every state, uh, their DMV, your DMV laws are, are different as to where these trucks are allowed to drive, whether it be on-road or off-road. But there are two classifications for mini trucks in the U.S. One is off-road use only, which again, can still be used on-road in certain states under certain restrictions. For off-road use only, mini trucks can be brought in brand spanking new all the way up to 2018, 2019s right now. Um, if they're designated for off-road use only, have a off-road EPA certificate attached to them. Sometimes they require speed limitations, things like that. Um, for true on-road use, that's where that 25 year rule comes into effect for the United States. So they need to be 25 years old to be considered a on-road vehicle or licensable for on-road in most, in most states in the US. Um, any of the bigger trucks, like you see us bring in some of the Mazda Bongos, uh, Toyota Town Aces, Suzuki Jimneys, any of those vehicles that don't actually classify as a, as a K-class mini truck, like a, a true mini truck, those do need to be 25 years old uh, for the most part to, to bring into the United States. Um, so again, depending if you're from the US or Canada, anywhere from brand new to 25 years old in the US, uh, in Canada, 15 years straight away. Um, Again, street legality is going to depend on your province, on your state, uh, so you'll have to check. Uh, we'll put a link uh, later on in the uh, comment section uh, with some resources for the United States to see what's legal in what state. And in Canada, if they pass a, uh, if they can pass your on-road inspection, like your your out-of-province inspection in Canada, you can get them on the road in every province except for Quebec. Uh, Quebec requires them to be at least 25 years old. Uh, in order to get them licensed for the road. And again, still need to pass inspection there. Other than that, they're off-road use only in Quebec. But uh, some of the other questions we get very commonly is, are they all right-hand drive and can you get them in left-hand drive? All Japanese mini trucks are right-hand drive. So they're if they're true fresh trucks straight out of Japan, they're going to be right-hand drive. Any left-hand drive trucks that you see are going to be uh, either converted uh, you know, taken to the Philippines is really common. They'll buy up parts trucks, cut them to pieces, convert them to left-hand drive, bolt them back together, and then ship them out as, as left-hand converted trucks. Sometimes you'll see that out of Japan as well as a converted truck. Um, Chinese trucks are left-hand are, are left drive. Uh, some of the Italian trucks are left-hand drive, but Japanese mini trucks from the get-go are all right-hand drive. Um, so one of the questions we've got coming in, uh, about the best way of finding a uh, finding a good condition agricultural truck. Um, honestly, it's just keeping your eyes open, uh, using a good exporter that has uh, access to all of the Japanese auctions. They come up all the time. Honestly, a 2000 to 2004 Suzuki's in really nice shape. Uh, probably get our hands or could get our hands on I would say five to 10 a month easily, you know, so it's, it's not that they don't exist. You just have to keep your eyes open. A lot of exporters that hold stock, like actually keep stock of mini trucks don't tend to buy up the nice, clean, low mile stuff uh, for the most part because they get expensive. So typically you're going to want to go like a, to a direct to auction exporter or a dealer to find a, a low mile, uh, good condition, you know, uh, mini truck. If you're talking agricultural spec, like actual no hand spec with the, um, Differential lock, the, yeah, they just don't, they're not, they were only offered in that agricultural package and in some dump models. So that's just a waiting game to actually sit and watch and wait and look at auctions for those things. Um, 
As far as how difficult it is to drive on the right-hand side, it's super simple. The nice thing with these trucks is they're very narrow. Like when you're sitting in the driver's seat on the right-hand side, I mean, you could literally reach over and grab the, uh, the other side. Like it's just an arm's length away. So even if you're on the wrong side of the road, typically it's not even that weird to be on the wrong side because you're, you're not in a big, you know, big vehicle as it were, you're not way off to the side, um, shifting with your opposite hand you pick it up really easily. The pedals are the same placement, so you don't have to relearn, you know, brake and gas and clutch. Uh, you'd pick it up way faster than most guys think, not difficult at all to drive, you know, on the right-hand side uh, of the vehicle, especially off-road. When you're off-road and you don't have any references like that center line to deal with, not an issue. On-road country roads, I actually prefer, like if you're on a country road, a narrow country road with no center line, uh, it's actually nice being on the right-hand side because you can basically drive, you know, right up to the uh, right up to the ditch side, nice and close on a narrow road, and uh, know where you're at exactly. So there are some benefits on country roads for that right-hand side uh, thing, but uh, automatics. That's what I was the next thing I was going to get to as far as are any of them automatic. So yes, these mini trucks were offered in two-wheel drive, four-wheel drive, automatic manual transmissions. There's a few variations of the manual transmissions in terms of speeds and things like that as well. So there are automatics available in these mini trucks. The reason why you don't see a lot of people bringing in automatics uh, is that they aren't that great for off-road or bigger tires. Uh, the automatics for the most part on the older trucks were only three speeds. So like literally a three speed automatic transmission, no low range. Uh, so when you're talking like a 45, 50 horsepower motor running through a three speed automatic transmission, they had no power period, uh, even up hills, you know, things like that, especially not running bigger tires or off-road tires, just not enough power to turn big tires with the automatic, especially in mud or hills. So that's why most guys aren't bringing the automatics in. Even the newer trucks are typically only running uh, like a four-speed automatic. Some of them have gone to CVT on the brand new ones and things like that. But uh, typically most of them do not have a low range in the automatic transmissions, which is a big issue if you're planning on running them off-road, hills, mud, bigger tires. So uh, that's uh, that's the biggest issue. Um, as far as finding a mini truck that's left-hand drive, uh, again, you're gonna have to find one that's been converted uh, or a Chinese truck that's not a Japanese truck because any of the Japanese trucks are right-hand drive. So the only ones that you're gonna see are converted uh, to left-hand drive. Honestly, we don't even look at converted trucks um, because they literally are cut to shreds and welded back together to make them, you know, left-hand drive. Parts can be a little bit weird that way. Um, but again, our biggest concern is just the, the the actual structure of the truck. We're more into the really clean, low mile, fresh out of Japan stuff. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, they're... Uh, they're really good for hunting, especially if they're, you know, if you do them up properly with a little bit of a lift kit, uh, an ATV tire really makes a big difference, you know, where you can actually do some terrain ability with these things. So if you are planning on getting one for hunting around the farm, uh, you know, you're definitely going to want to do a lift kit and uh, a little bit of a little bit of a bigger tire on there makes a huge difference. As far as them being gas or diesel, all K-class mini trucks out of Japan are gas. Um, they're all 660 cc they all fit in a specific size and horsepower category in japan to be a k-class mini truck so that's why they're all basically the same subarus have a four-cylinder engine they're pretty much the only ones who run like a four-cylinder on some of the older subarus um, almost everybody else is a three-cylinder engine 660 cc's max uh, and all gasoline diesels don't come in until you get into the slightly larger japanese trucks uh, toyota town ace mazda bongo uh, Nissan Vanette, uh, the uh, Mitsubishi Delicas, those are basically where your diesel options are going to start in. And they're quite a bit bigger, uh, bulkier trucks, usually around 2,500 pounds, eight foot boxes on them to get into a diesel engine. Uh, if you check out our channel, we have done uh, some of the Mazda Bongos. We did a Toyota Town Ace diesel uh, about a year, year and a half ago. So you can check that video. It is on our, uh, on our channel. We've done obviously tons of videos on these mini trucks. So don't forget to check that out after the uh, live stream for sure. But uh, one of the other uh, really common questions we get, um, so I'm just flipping over to my, uh, to my list here. But uh, one of the other really common questions we get outside of, you know, the left-hand drive thing and the automatic is just the size. Like, you know, a lot of guys are wonder, will I fit in the thing? Um, most of these little trucks, again, are small. The average 
a man in Japan is five foot seven. Um, so they don't need to build their vehicles big there because if the average guy is only five foot seven, you know, a tall guy is going to be five foot nine, five, foot 10, maybe six feet tall. Uh, so it's pretty rare that they're dealing with, you know, six foot four, you know, guys trying to drive these things. So um, typically the cabs aren't built very big on these trucks, but uh, they uh, usually if you're under six feet tall, you're pretty good. The older trucks are smaller than the newer trucks. So the newer you get, the bigger they get. If you end up getting into something that's, you know, like 2013 and up, um, they're actually quite big. Like they stretch the cabs out pretty good on the new, new style ones anything in the mid two thousands, you know, over six feet tall can be a little bit tough. Five foot eight, five foot nine, you'll fit like a glove, uh, you know, no problem. The older trucks, if you're getting down into the early nineties, uh, mid nineties, even, uh, man, even at five foot nine, you're feeling big in that thing. They just tend to not have a ton of space in them. Different brands will fit differently for sure. Uh, as far as finding accessories like window visors, you can get those, like we can order those direct out of Japan. 99% of the trucks we get have the window visors on them uh, when they come out of Japan. So uh, if yours doesn't, or you've broken one, uh, they can be found from Japanese parts suppliers that will sell accessories, you know, direct uh, as far as finding those window visors. Um, as far as holding up to salted roads, rusting, depends on the age. So just like any of our North American vehicles, the newer these things get, the more rust proofing they started adding on them. So if you're picking up an old 1980s or 1990s truck, you're probably not going to have too much protection against rust. All the frames are painted on them and they are uh, undercoated for, uh, for the most part. So, I mean, that does help for sure. Uh, and again, undercoating them will help. As you get into the newer trucks, into the 90s, late 90s, 2000s, they started running galvanized beds, galvanized door panels, you know, rust proofing on a lot of the, uh, a lot of the stuff. So they get better as they get newer for sure for rust proofing. But uh, as far as offering our bumpers, uh, shipping's a real tough issue, uh, David. So, you know, a, a bumper is obviously it's wide, it's heavy, it's made of steel, kind of hard to make them, you know, where they'll break down and ship nice without costing an absolute arm and a leg, uh, for, for shipping. One of my best recommendations for bumpers is first and foremost, checking out a local fabrication shop. So I don't know, you know, if you were a local from Alberta and we can get that thing to you, you know, it'll make sense for sure to ship it. Anytime we look into the States, shipping's half the cost of the bumper and it just gets nuts. So, I mean, your best, just check in the local fabrication shop that deals with, you know, off-road fabrications. They tend to be a little more helpful because they, they deal with more, you know, weird stuff. And it's not difficult to get a set of bumpers built. Most shops probably only charge you in the three to $500 range to build a, you know, a decent set of custom bumpers, unless you're looking for something super crazy. Um, but yeah, I mean, we'd love to offer our bumpers and we are working on it. It's just the quotes we've been getting for shipping are just out to lunch. Um, Bobby's asking about putting regular or Supreme gasoline. Um, I recommend Supreme, but the biggest thing you want to get away from is ethanol. Uh, in my opinion, ethanol uh, is not that great. And again, these older engines, when you're talking, especially in the, in the carbureted stuff, stay far away from ethanol as you can. Ethanol is terrible for uh, any, any rubber or plastic parts and pieces. Carburetors, tend to get eaten up pretty quick by ethanol blended fuel. So if you can stay with premium, something without ethanol in it, make a big difference for sure. Um, but uh, generally standard running wise, you won't really notice a performance difference between say like an 87 or a 92 or a 94 octane. Uh, but ethanol is, is a killer for sure. Uh, you'll, you'll end up with issues down the road. Um, installing a winch is kind of goes along with the custom bumpers so on most of these trucks there's no place to just kind of plop a winch in uh and and bolt it to a frame as it were so you are going to have to build like a custom winch mount to the front so a lot of times we will build that in as part of our bumper on the front whether it's a two inch receiver hitch to put a winch you know a winch plate removable winch plate in or actually build the winch plate right into the bumper um that's basically the easiest way to get a winch installed on one is to make it as part of a front bumper. But again, that's going to be custom fabricated, uh, to be completely honest with you. Um, so David, uh, as far as aftermarket diff locks, there are no aftermarket diff locks that I've seen, but there are limited slip kits. We've never tried any of them, so I don't know how well they work, but I have seen limited slip kits available for these trucks. Um, but aftermarket differential locks or limited slip kits can be pretty tough. So your best bet is to find one um, that has a diff lock, you know, right out of the factory. But uh, 
As far as the standard transmissions being four speed or five speed, it's going to depend on the year. So older style Suzuki trucks came with several different transmissions. Some of them were uh, five speed straight, no low range, just a five speed manual transmission. Um, the met, they also came in a four speed with a high and low range sub transmission. Um, some of them you'll see that were actually six speed had like a five speed transmission with an extra low first gear. But, uh, and then the newer style ones, 1999 and up, most of them are a five speed with a true high, low range in them in the four wheel drive models. So honestly, it's going to depend on the model, uh, as far as what's available for those, those transmissions. But, uh, Jimny's are awesome. Uh, I love the Jimny's for off-road. They are honestly the best thing you can get for an off-road truck. Uh, these mini trucks are fantastic around the farm and the yard. But a Jimny is probably a better option if you're looking for a true bush buggy, something to get off-road. They're far more modifiable. The tra they're, they're built heavier, full body on frame construction on the Jimny's. Um, you can put bigger tires, bigger lift kits. There's more power in them. Uh, you can't go wrong with a Jimny. They're fantastic. We've uh, we've got done a couple of them and they're, they're really great. Um, as far as size-wise, trying to fit in a mini truck, honestly, it's tough. They're, they're uh, in a true mini truck. There's not a lot of room between the steering wheel and the seat. So most guys that get up uh, height-wise, you know, up over six feet, you'll be cramped. Weight-wise, if you get up over 220 pounds, you might start to get pretty squashed in that thing. If you're a little bit shorter uh, and, and heavier, you might shoehorn in there 240 pounds or so, but they are getting pretty tight. There's just not a no room to move that seat back, you know, so that's kind of the biggest issue with them. Um, performance upgrades standard engines really there's nothing you're going to do for performance upgrades on these trucks uh that's you know locally available engine swaps there's all kinds of crazy stuff out there for engine swaps um one of the most common ones was arctic cat a couple years ago took the suzuki carry engine the k6a engine redid the internals and turbocharged it making about 110 horsepower so stock that k6a engine makes about 48 50 horsepower arctic cat shoehorned that thing into their sleds making 110 horsepower on the t660 turbo um, those can be modified to fit in a suzuki mini truck it's not like a true drop-in but uh, we know customers who have done it and uh, you know so as far as an engine swap yeah you can shoehorn a, a you know a t660 arctic cat turbo engine in some of the suzukis i've seen guys doing all kinds of stuff with hibusa engines rotary engines out of uh, Mazdas and stuff like that. So, I mean, the sky's the limit if you're mechanically inclined, but the closest thing you're going to get to a drop-in is a T660 Arctic Cat with the K6A. Um, now, as far as parts availability, um, you know, it's, that's the biggest issue can be shipping. So, common things like air filters, oil filters, that's it's not too bad, but if you're looking for like a drive shaft, as it were, uh, the part itself is not that much more than you'd expect to pay out of North America. Shipping gets pretty crazy out of Japan. It does. So you do want a compound ship. Like if you can, you know, you don't want to order a hundred dollar part, you're going to pay a hundred dollars shipping out of Japan. You come up with your laundry list, 500, a thousand dollars worth of parts, everything you need for that thing. I think the most I've ever paid for shipping out of Japan is 150 bucks, you know, uh, regardless of how much it's been. So that's your best bet is just to put as much stuff as you can together. Uh, brake pads and stuff aren't too bad because there's a lot of places you can get that stuff. So like even on our website, you can pick up, we keep brake pads in stock for most of the common Suzuki trucks, uh, things like that. But uh, yeah, uh, other than that, you know, yeah, I mean, you can, you can do a smaller steering wheel. We've seen guys do that, swap out steering wheels to get a little extra room there, you know, to the steering wheel. That's doable for sure. Um, we've, uh, we've seen guys do that for sure. But uh, yeah, uh, Jesse's plowing snow right now uh, as as he speaks. Apparently, you better keep your eyes on the uh, keep your eyes on the uh, snow there, <laughs> so you don't run into something. Uh, as far as brands that we like best, um, I would say the most common uh, is Suzuki. Now, there's a few reasons for that. Um, Suzuki has been the best selling truck in Japan for like the last 50 years. They're the most common, easiest to get parts for, and in our opinion, they're built the best as far as off road ability. So we like the Suzuki's the best. They're kind of the easiest one to buy if you can buy. Honda, I'll be honest, I'm a huge Honda fan. I've worked for Honda for years, uh, not anymore, obviously. I've owned nine Honda vehicles. I do not like the Honda mini trucks. They build them like a minivan. They're not built like a truck. They're difficult to lift. Their four-wheel drive system isn't a true four-wheel drive system. The they don't use a transfer case. They use more of a center slip differential like a CRV. So they don't make really great utility trucks. They don't have a frame underneath them for the most part. 
So the Hondas, I would honestly stay away from if you're looking for a, a, a true off-road mini truck. You know, they, they tend to not be built that great. Kind of just like Honda's trucks now. You know, they don't really build a heavy-duty truck. Their, their Honda Pilot or the Honda Ridgeline is based on the Honda Pilot and Honda, you know, Odyssey minivan chassis. So kind of the same thing in the mini trucks. Um, as far as disc brakes, they're disc brakes up front drum brakes in the back on pretty much all mini trucks. So pretty common, uh, just drum brakes on the back and discs uh, in the front. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much the the common common setup for those. So yeah, I mean, it, like kind of go back to the question about which ones work best. Uh, if I had to make a list, and again, this is personal preference for a lot of guys. So I'm not saying any of them are bad. Uh, I would say Honda or Suzuki first for off-road. Daihatsu is probably our second choice. They're just such a great mini truck. Um, uh, better on-road than the Suzuki's if you're looking for a true on-road truck. Daihatsu's are, are awesome. Mitsubishi kind of falls underneath that because they're kind of in the middle. They're 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 good off-road, not bad on-road, a uh, little easier to modify than the Subarus and the Hondas. Not a big fan of the Subarus and the Hondas at all because of their design. They're they're just they're made more like a car than a truck. So they they aren't that great for modifying and lifting and things like that. Again, not bad vehicles. So anybody who's got a Subaru, they're great quality is awesome on them just like anybody else but that weird suspension and rear engine thing just doesn't bode well for uh you know doing work on them and lifting um but yeah tom uh, give us a call or send us an email uh you know for sure for parts we try to help you out best we can um engine wise between uh, adam's asking between the f6a and k6a honestly you probably wouldn't notice a difference um jumping in one to the other they're they're similar spec the, the f6 the k6a basically was brought in just like everything it was brought in for better emissions you know upgraded so the, the f6a was like 1989 all the way up to like 19 uh, sorry 2001 so i mean it was a kind of a long-standing cast block engine in 2001 they went to that all new aluminum design k6a uh with the timing chain made some modifications but power wise power wise you really wouldn't notice a difference um you know they say they have a little bit better response and a little bit better power but you know true hard numbers wise the f6a is an awesome motor k6a they work great too so uh you know between them pretty simple um yeah uh skid plating there's not really much there's kind of your basic plastic skid plating under the front end on most of these trucks some under the transmission and engine but as far as like heavy off-road skid plating most guys will end up building their own if you kind of wanted to you know beef up the uh, the skid plating uh, on the uh, on the bottom end of these things um as far as changing the bearings for big tires generally not it's more just making sure that what you got is in good shape so that's usually the biggest issue we see with guys modifying these things if, especially depending on the age if you're modifying like a 25 year old mini truck i mean if those wheel bearings are the original ones from 25 years ago and then you're sticking big tires on it yeah you could have some issues but we honestly don't see too many issues with the newer style trucks uh, and especially if they're well maintained uh, so it's just a matter of like i say knowing what you have how old it is you know eventually wheel bearings are going to go but they're not chintzy like they're pretty this is all automotive grade stuff right so it's it's pretty heavy duty stuff so just making sure you have good wheel bearings uh, it's sealed that aren't full of dust you know dust and you know grit already by the time you put your lift kit and big tires on uh that's usually the the bigger issue um but uh as, as far as doing a video on the two inch lift install uh you know I, i'm all over that one i'd love to show that video the, the biggest issue I run into with doing these installation videos, especially when it comes to modifying the suspension, uh, unfortunately is liability. We are a, we are a business, uh, you know, so maybe someday I'll, I'll show it on my own truck just as a, hey, here's how I did it on my personal vehicle, but uh, pretty tough to, to, you know, give professional advice on modifying the suspension uh, and staying away from any liability issues there. So that's kind of our main reason I don't show that, but they are very simple to do for sure as far as the two inch lift uh not a not a big uh big thing there uh drake i'm not sure what your question is about the vans um so sorry if i missed your if you had an earlier question there um but uh yeah the vans are are very popular as well um as far as uh the one comment about it being bothered that asian vehicles have to be 15 years old in order to come into canada it's the the way that Canada Customs and Canada Transport Canada words it is if the vehicle was never originally intended for sale in Canada, 
then it has to be 15 years old. So Unimogs, they actually did have some, you know, Canadian classifications as far as the, uh, the Unimogs and stuff like that, because they have been a commercial vehicle for a long time. But if it wasn't originally intended for sale in Canada, it's got to be 15 years old. That's kind of how the wording works. It's simply a protectionist thing. Obviously, if we could just free market, bring in any vehicle uh, we wanted, it would be a, a big difference, uh, you know, as far as bringing stuff in for sure. But, uh, you know, it's so it's, it is different. So if you're bringing in a Chevy truck out of the United States into Canada, again, Chevy's originally intended that truck to be sold in Canada anyway. So as long as it meets all the Canadian safety standards, you can bring in a brand new Chevy. But as far as these oddball Suzuki's, Jimny's, Dai, Daihatsu's, yeah, that's where that 15 year rule uh, does come into play. But uh, anyway, uh, that about does it. I don't know if you guys have any other questions for us at all. Um, we'd be happy to help you out. If you do have any questions, you know, you can always leave us a comment. We try to get back to our comments. Sometimes, unfortunately, we get behind if there's too many of them. It's tough to get back to everybody's comments on the video uh, after the fact. You can always send us an email, uh, info at foursonsoffroad.com. Uh, there will be a link in the, the uh, in the description there. But uh, there you go. Drake's asking about a uh, mini truck model that can handle driving 55 miles per hour for a long period of time. Uh, no, there's not. Uh, not a true K-class mini truck. They're all the same 660 cc's. They're all about 50 horsepower. They were all designed to operate comfortably at about 60 kilometers an hour, 30 miles an hour, 35 miles an hour. So they're pretty comfortable up to about 45. 55 they will do it but i mean you're literally foot to the floor pinned so some of the bigger trucks you get into like the bigger class of trucks uh the Daihats or sorry the mazda bongos toyota town aces they've already got 1.8 liter 2.2 liter motors those things will handle highway all day long of course the true k-class mini trucks i wouldn't buy it to be doing 55 mile per hour day in day out that's for sure um as far as a dot quad or off-road tire that's street legal that fits in Canada and the US, the only one I'm aware of is the uh, STI Black Diamond that has an actual DOT stamp on the side. They're still terrible street tire. They're way too aggressive, noisy. You know, you're going to wear them out like crazy. So really, there's not a great um, DOT off-road tire, unfortunately, for these trucks in Canada and in the US. Um, we run winter tires if a guy needs a true on-road with a little bit of softer compound with some off-road grip. Uh, it tends to help. But as far as that DOT ATV tire, uh, the Black Diamond's the only one I'm aware of. So you can try them, see how you like them. I haven't heard too many great reviews on them, to be honest. Um, but uh, yeah, once you get into the uh, bigger trucks, you know, uh, sorry, back to the comment about the uh, 55 mile per hour thing, the bigger trucks definitely will handle the the bigger loads, higher speeds, they're bigger engines. So like the Toyota, the Toyota Town Ace is one of the really common ones. They run a 750 kilogram payload in Japan instead of a 350 kilogram payload, like these little Japanese, uh, the, the K-class trucks, like a, the Suzuki carries and such. But uh, um, do I buy customer trucks or only from Japan? Unless I physically know the history on the truck. So like we've had guys buy the wrong truck, you know, get into it, decide, hey, we don't want it. Uh, but literally put 100 kilometers on it from when it came in fresh. We will tend to uh, bring in the odd trade in one or two of those, but almost 99% are all coming direct out of Japan, fresh, clean, low mile units. That way we're, you know, we know a little bit more about the history of it that way than we tend to see them come into Japan and get, or into Canada or the US and get pretty beat up or not maintained properly. Uh, whereas in Japan, if they're registered, they're getting inspected every two years just to keep them on the road, which is really nice. Um, as far as road tire, it's going to depend on if you're upgrading to a 14 inch rim, uh, you can usually run like a 165 series tire with no lift kit. You put a little bit of a lift kit on there, you can get into a 175, 185 series, uh, you know, 14 inch tire uh, on these trucks for, for most of them. Anyways, again, it's going to depend on the exact model. They're all, not all the same, unfortunately, but uh, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, you can definitely uh, check out uh, the comment section for our website. You know, we, uh, we uh, are happy to share information. So if you do have any specific questions, it's always best to email us, uh, info at foursonsoffroad.com. It's gonna be a lot easier than uh, going through the comments on the uh, YouTube channel here, because we do miss out once in a while. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's about it for now. So uh, we're uh, happy to answer your questions uh, in the future. Just contact us, foursonsoffroad.com or info at foursonsoffroad.com. And be sure to check out our channel, subscribe, 
Uh, we've got lots of other videos on there, so uh, don't forget to check that out. Thanks for uh, watching.